the Global Issues Working Group has sponsored the Global Issues Lecture Series for this fall, and uh, we'd like to welcome you all to the lecture series. And this is the third, fourth, this is the fourth in a series of six lectures that we're doing on uh, global issues, regional conflict, uh, global perspectives. And Dr. Lorraine Murray is going to be leading this lecture. Dr. Murray is a, uh, an expert in social work. She's also from South Africa, and she has worked with NGOs in South Africa to heal from the wounds of apartheid. And she's going to be giving a lecture today on multiple woundedness. So, Dr. Lorraine. this opportunity. It is my privilege to be here today and talk a little bit more about this concept. It is a new concept that has emerged uh, basically from Nicaragua, from Marta Cabrera's work in Nicaragua in the 90s. I don't know how many of you know of, of Central America or the war, the civil wars that was going on for a long period of time and communities that was devastated because of those ongoing uh, trauma that they have experienced. Uh, so she developed this concept, and I will talk a little bit more about that today, and also how one uh, NGO in South Africa actually followed that model and started to apply it in the Western Cape in South Africa. But before we do that, let me introduce myself a little bit more to you, because John for the introduction. Let me explain a little bit more who I am, and that might help you also to create context for our discussion today. Um, as uh, Dr. David Ann said, I am um, a social worker. I have been in community development most of my, my adult life. I was born in South Africa. My ancestors been in Africa about since 1676. <coughs> so it's a long, long time. When people ask me, where are you from in Europe? I said, I don't know, because it's been a very long time. As far as we can track the ancestors back to Europe, it is uh, in France and yeah, that's basically most of the ancestors came from there. The, uh, they were fleeing uh, religious persecution uh, in the Reformation and uh, Huguenots. The, so they went to South Africa and some came to America, I believe. So, yeah. So um, I've worked in the rural areas in South Africa with oppressed populations for a long time. Uh, so I'm more a practitioner than an academician. I came to academia later in my life. Uh, I've been in America now for about 12 years consistently. And um, I go regularly back to South Africa where I still uh, working with a partner there in community development, community actual organizational development and program evaluation. I go back every year or every other year. I was just there this summer where I met with this organization that I'm going to talk about today. But I'm very familiar with this type of organization because I work in, this, uh, NGO, in the NGO sector for many, many years. So I would welcome any questions that you might have as we talk because let us just do it kind of informal. Uh, I have presented a uh, prepared a PowerPoint presentation for you, but I don't want us to be so formal, okay? So ask questions as we go along. I don't know exactly how much you know about South Africa and the legacy of apartheid and all that stuff. So I'm going to give you a little introduction to uh, here is South Africa. You probably have seen, know where it is. It's the farthest point south in Africa right here, at the, the bottom, uh, and it borders on Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Namibia. So all of this is South Africa. There's nine provinces. So um, just to give you a little picture, 
And we're going to talk mostly about this one right here, the Western Cape. Unfortunately, this, this map is not so clear, but specifically about that tip here, right here, the Cape Peninsula. We're going to talk about, because this community, uh, Hanover Park, is situated in that little peninsula piece. Uh, there's another picture here, so that it may be. Here are all the provinces. Right here, we're going to talk about Cape Town, right here. Any questions? Okay. Okay, let me give you a little bit of a history. Quick. Quick and dirty history of South Africa. <laughs> it is, it's very hard to talk uh, fast about it, but uh, who of you know about apartheid? Who of you have heard about the word? So, Tell me what you think. What does it mean? Let's talk a little bit about it. Let me see what you mean. That what you know about it. The people's living separately. Okay. Very good. So it is the word apartheid. Is Afrikaans word means separate. <coughs> there, there was through the years in South Africa. There was legally they talked about separate but equal. Uh, in America, you also had that. In the 60s, in the 50s, you had that kind of rhetoric saying we separate but equal, so we provide opportunities for people separate. And it was a division based on race, race and ethnicity. So uh, with apartheid in South Africa, it was not only uh, informal kind of concept, but what, it was a legal concept. It was built into the law that people could not live in certain areas if you were black, for example. You couldn't marry who you, you wanted to marry because of your color. You couldn't work where you wanted to work because of your color. So it was a, a total division within the law. So it's not only a social division, but it was a legal division. It was built into the law. Even in, the, in America these days, we still get some form of apartheid, but it's not legal. So people still live in communities that are uh, sometimes very homogeneous and not really diverse. But in South Africa, uh, until 1994, it was again, well, some of the laws changed in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, but uh, officially, officially apartheid was abandoned in 1994 when there was uh, a total new government put in place and people were, everybody was able to vote for the first time. I had the privilege of working in one of those voting booths in the central area of Cape Town, which is a huge metropolitan area. And it was absolutely fantastic. There were lines of about three miles long. Everybody came from everywhere. And, uh, you know, the voting rate was 98%. It was so high, everybody came to vote. So I, I was working those lines and I went to a few of the elderly people and I asked them, are you not tired of waiting? Because they have been waiting for four hours, five hours. And they looked at me and they said, child, I have waited my whole life for this. What is another few hours? You know, it, it was so moving. People were crying, they were laughing, they were singing. It was a wonderful experience. So a new nation was born in 1994. But uh, also with that came a lot of, uh, you can imagine, when people were separated for, for a long, long time. It started uh, because South Africa was a British colony twice, a Dutch colony once, and in 1910, it became a union. In 1964, it became a republic. So uh, 
it, it has a long legacy of apartheid. So you have generations after generations that grew up in an oppressive society where they were denied their rightful place in society. And that was the majority of the population. That is the unfortunate situation that people who were black people were denied their rightful place in society, although they were the majority. So um, after apartheid was over in 1994, and all of you know about Nelson Mandela, right? Right? Okay, good. So how long was he in jail again? 20 years? Close. <laughs> A long time, right? 26 years, yeah. <laughs> so if you ha ever have the opportunity to go to South Africa, you want to go to Robben Island, where he was in prison. It is now a national museum, and people go with a ferry, and they go and visit Robin Island, and you can actually see his cell that he was, in jail cell where he was. Uh, not the whole 26 years, because they moved him to another part of the country also, but for several years he was on Robin Island. Okay, let me say something about Ubuntu. Ubuntu is also like we have here in Hawaii, Aloha, the spirit of Aloha. Here in, uh, in, in Africa, throughout Africa, actually, the word Ubuntu, it has the same connotation. I am because you are, or I am part of you. So it is based on a collective culture. We care for each other uh, because we all belong to other uh, collective uh, cultures the main thing is that that we learn together we live together we care for each other we do things together it's also group think can easily develop out of that collective culture here in the west we have more individualistic cultures and if you think about these two on a continuum so here's individualistic culture, here's collective culture, and we move usually, societies move between these two extremes. Now South Africa is, uh, I would say, more to the collective side, close to the extreme side. I grew up in that society, and you know, even today, if, we, if I think about my education, for example, that I got here in America, when I did go to classes and I studied things, I would always think, how can I apply it to the group? I never thought of how it will benefit me because I was so part of that culture that you it become part of who you are. All our cultures become part of who we are because that's how we grew up, right? That is our environment in which you live it every day. And so, so what do you think might be one of the challenges of a collective culture? What do you think? We know that individualistic cultures, there's challenges there too, right? Both have really big challenges. What could be some of the, the challenges for collective cultures? What do you think? You'd be cheating if I spoke up because we had a conversation about this. <laughs> but um, I know after something like apartheid, when there needs to be reconciliation, it's very difficult for individuals to talk about uh, personal traumas, yep. and thus it, it, it's harder for the, the collective to move forward together yeah. because it's harder to coordinate everyone taking a step forward as opposed to one person. Absolutely. So, so the group is central. Your individual needs are put on a secondary level. So you deny often your own feelings and your own emotions and your own needs and wants because of the group. So the individual can easily disappear within a collective culture. And that is the, be the challenge thing to balance those two, that uh, both of them will be parallel and not uh, primary and secondary. So I think that's also the challenge for this society that we 
will have both of those as equally important and not the individual is everything and the group from second, you know, like we often see. Okay, now if you look at some basic demographics of South Africa, there's about 40 million people. Very interesting piece here, after 1994, several million of people just appeared magically <laughs> because in the apartheid years they didn't count people wow. properly. What they did is in this huge, like in Sudan, <coughs> which is one of the largest black cities in South Africa, there's probably about five million people. What they did is they didn't do proper census procedures. What they did, they flew over with helicopters and they kind of estimated how many people there are. So, so uh, now the demographics look quite different than before. So. Uh, Interesting thing. There's 13 languages, official languages. The, the legal language is English. I speak Afrikaans. Uh, that is my, my language that I grew up with. And it depends on what area of the country you live, which combination of, of languages you speak. Uh, in, in the Western Cape, the, the predominant languages will be English, Afrikaans, and then Kota. So there's those three. I grew up in the middle of South Africa where Sesotho was one of the other black languages. I grew up on the, on the border of Lesotho in South Africa. And we would often go to Lesotho because my mother had family living there. And so we would go and visit. Yeah, okay. Socioeconomic status. The majority of people in South Africa is it lives in poverty, unfortunately. And this is rough statistics, uh, around 65% of people are in poverty. Uh, in the past, it was very much poverty was on the same lines as race. Race and class was on the same line. Now those things are changing a little bit. But according to the Gini Index, South Africa is one of the most <coughs> unequal societies in the world because the gap between the rich and the poor is so significant. There is a growing black middle class uh, at the moment. Unfortunately, uh, they are also not looking out so much for, for other people who are in poverty. And I think that is happening everywhere in the world. Once people are moving up on the social ladder, they don't look back, you know, they just move forward. So that is a quick snapshot. And then in the Western Cape, uh, there's about probably more, six million, maybe more to eight million people. And that is now, you remember this little uh, peninsula that I showed you? That is mostly what I'm probably talking about. In that area, there's about six to eight million people. Um, now Hanover Park, the little community that I'm going to talk about is also uh, part of that, the suburbs of Cape Town. It is urban. Um, the unemployment rate is really high. In some areas, it's about 50% unemployment, especially for young people who, who graduate from high school. They have a real hard time to find jobs. Uh, they also have, of course, a generation who never went to school because of uh, the uprising against apartheid. In the 70s and 80s, we have a whole generation who never went back to school again because they said, liberation before education. That was the slogan. So, uh, and they, after the changes in South Africa, many of them were too old to go back to school. And now they are parents already and so they are uneducated unable to really take part in the new South Africa so uh, you can uh, imagine the consequences of that that legacy what that happened um, that's why you have the educational level that's 85 percent of people that have not completed high school um, there's about 49,000 people in in the little uh, community of Hanover Park. Uh, 
people are 60% of people earn less than $200 per month, which is actually quite higher, more than most areas. Now, some of these issues that you see in that community is poverty, unemployment, learning problems with children, absent male role models, family dysfunction, broken relationships, domestic violence, alcohol and drug abuse, gangsterism, inadequate access to recreational facilities, and all forms of child abuse. Now, you can understand that foundation is very fertile for gang formations, and drug trade and also prostitution. So all of these kind of social ills of society, you can imagine is happening there. Now here's a few pictures that I thought you might want to see what the place look like. So here's Hanover Park. It's mostly this kind of living environment that people have. It is not very high rises, but it is very basic uh, dwelling uh, accommodation for people. People live mostly on the street. They sleep in their houses and they live mostly on the street because the weather is fairly nice in Cape Town. Although in winter time, uh, Cape Town get winter rainfall, so uh, sometimes you have rain for three weeks in June, July, August. <coughs> It's really heavy rainfall at times. And then people still kind of live outside, you know, so it's... Lorraine, this was is that government housing? Was that housing provide, built by the government or yeah, private? Yeah, it's government provided housing, yeah. Kind of section eight situation, mostly. And this is how it looks on a Saturday with the market, open markets outside, people buying and selling and one of the, the situations with the project was that the Groups Area Act, there was a large community within, in front of uh, Table Mountain, in the heart of Cape Town. And then the Groups Areas Act came and said, you cannot live here anymore, you have to move. We will move you to behind the mountains in the Cape Flats that they call. And that was an area that was uh, very sandy, it was probably before ocean area. And so they relocated those communities to those areas. And they, you people who are studying sociology know what that do to communities. It's disrupting community life, it's disrupting family life, so when people were thrown together in those areas, the whole community came apart, actually. This functioning uh, uh, family and community life appeared much more rapidly than before. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, this group of people speaks mostly Afrikaans and English. It's a combination. Cape Town has actually kind of a dialect of Afrikaans. It's such a mixture of languages. So it's a kind of, I enjoy when I go back because then I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> and over Park is, has also a very high crime rate. Uh, there's some pictures of what is happening with gangs. It's a very high gang. Area. There's estimate of about 100,000 gang members in, only in the Cape Town region. This, uh, I will talk more about that. Uh, I've been in workshops where the gangs and the police were shooting at each other and we were, had to lay on the floor and wait until the shooting is over to continue with the workshops. I have also worked in some of these communities, not this specific community, but very similar uh, that is close to this one. Um, and there's regularly funerals. Funerals is actually something that uh, Saturdays is set aside for funerals. Um, people know Saturday you don't do much else, you go to funerals. Um, 
this is just a picture of how children experience uh, this traumatic events that's continuous mm. happening around them. Uh, this little child said, feel, feels like it is happening over and over again. And this is a nine-year-old child that actually de demonstrated the violence that they are viewing every day. <coughs> Okay, let, let's talk a little bit about the concept of multiple woundedness. Uh, Marta Ferbera of Nicaragua, as I said, she talks about this phenomena as trauma and pain afflict not only individuals. When they become widespread and ongoing, they affect entire communities and even the country as a whole. The implications are serious for people's health, the resilience of the country's social fabric, the success of development schemes, and the hope of future generations. You all know about PTSD, right? Individual PTSD. This is a broader PTSD. Mm. The whole idea is that it's not only individuals that get PTSD, it's also communities that can develop PTSD. So it is a new kind of concept that she came with, and not many of the development uh, organizations, NGOs, CBOs, have actually embraced this concept, and that's why I wanted to come and talk to you about this today, because it is really a new entrepreneurial way of looking at old problems. Because, you know, we, we usually try to solve old problems with old methods, and then it doesn't work, and we like, What's going on? We work so hard, we try so many things, and it's not working. So this is a new concept that is now actually starting to, to grow in South Africa. The other organization that I also visited while I was there in June, uh, the New World Foundation, they go into, and, and, and that is the NGO that has been in existence for 30 years, they go going to start looking more closely at this concept and change some of their development projects to reflect more this philosophy in some ways. Okay, the context of violence, let me talk a little bit about that. John, are you giving the time? Yeah, you're, you're good. Okay. You're really good. <laughs> I, I can't, there's no clock here, so I can't no, see how I'm doing. Um, like I said before, intergenerational no, violence is directly linked to the process of internalized oppression created by a partner. It is very interesting, this concept, that people internalize their own oppression, and later on, the oppressor don't have to oppress people anymore because people will do it to themselves. You know, often you see in, in, in these type of communities uh, that people don't think very much of themselves. They don't, their self-esteem is low, their self-image is low, and they just can't move. They are immobilized, they are passive, and people say, what's going on? Why would these people not do something? Because they have really internalized their own oppression. And that, that is one of the real uh, challenges to help people then to move out of that. It's linked to feelings of despair, anger, rage, sadness, sense of helplessness, and self-hatred. The consequence is that it was integrated into the fabric of the family and community, leading to self-abuse and, of course, other abuses. The three major violent crimes that we have in South Africa is the interpersonal assaults, robbery, and rape. You know that South Africa has the highest rape figure in the world, actually. Every six hours a woman is killed by an intimate partner, also domestic violence is also, family violence is, is very high. Um, There's a little bit more about the interpersonal violence. It's five times higher than the global trend. Uh, the South African national average is 31.9%. Uh, 
no, not per se, 31.9 people per 100,000. And then the Western Cape is actually much higher, 44.2. Now, an overpop was, probably is still to a certain extent, considered to be the most violent place in South Africa. There's often between 28 and 35 people killed per month just because of other things. Uh, as I said before, gang activity is really a lot of gangs. There's 100,000 members in Cape Town, not only in Hanover Park, of course, but in the broader Cape Town. But it's an estimate about 137 different gangs. The mongrels and Americans are the two gangs that is most active in Hanover Park. Okay, I'm not going to skip this. We talk enough about all the sadness, right? Let's talk about good things for a change. Are you depressed yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we get we can talk ourselves into depression with all this terrible things. But there is actually some hope because this organization has done some really fantastic work. And uh, I don't know whether you know, but uh, South Africa has the largest NGO sector in the world because of the legacy of apartheid. Because the NGO sector has developed parallel to the, to the government structures because the government did not provide services to, to the whole population of South Africa. So you had actually two government, if you will, then that developed parallel to each other. So, um, and a lot, and, the, and they have done some very good work. Many of, of their leaders are now in government. Uh, that also created, of course, a brain drain, a leadership vacuum in the NGO sector. Um, the organization CASE, it's called CASE, Community Action Towards a Safer Environment, started in 2001. So it's a fairly new organization. It has not been around for a long time. It was started by a, a community psychologist. So who, some of you are studying psychology. Uh, these are opportunities that you cannot, if you don't only have to work with individuals, you can also work with community. Lane Benjamin and also uh, a social worker Susan Farrell started this organization. Uh, the mission statement, case seeks to break the cycle of crime and violence in which people live by equipping community members to recognize and respond appropriately to both cause and effects of crime and violence in their communities. So the mission statement probably look a lot like other organizations, but the way that they do it is different. Traditionally, and if you now think about what I said earlier about collective cultures, other NGOs would start with the community. These guys said, hmm, we have now seen all these projects, all these programs that NGO started. Things are not getting that better. So what is going on there? And so when they look at Marta Cabrera's multiple wounded concept, they thought, hmm, maybe it's because people are carrying those traumas of apartheid and violence still within them and they have never had the opportunity to really talk about it. So what they decided to do is to start with the individual. So it's now going like this, and not like this, or rather just like this, because it hardly ever came to the individual. So they flip this, this pyramid over, and they start with the individual, which is a really interesting thing in South Africa, because people are not used to talk about themselves. I often, you know, when people ask me to, to tell more about my story, I get really nervous about it. I don't like to do that because it's not part of the culture. And, and, and then people say, but why? You have stories to tell. It's like, yeah, but I don't like to tell it, you know, because it's just part of our culture. 
agriculture. So when they started with this project, it was very interesting because uh, for the first time, people could actually come and talk about what they have gone through. Women could come and talk about some of the traumas that they had with domestic violence, ongoing trauma. It's not only one event. They live in those communities that is uh, subjected to violence all the time, and, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Okay. Now, the theory of change that this organization worked with is ecological systems approach. Yeah, you know, you can actually use these theories that you learn in class. It is this organization based all their work on these theories and put it in, in action. Who of you are studying sociology? I don't even know who you are. <laughs> what are you guys studying? Give me an idea. Nursing, good. Biology, okay. What about you guys? I you graduated. You <laughs> graduated. Economics and political science. Okay, very good. Excellent. I'm a staff member. Staff member, okay. Business. Information systems. Okay, yeah, good. Okay. But you all have gone through liberal arts, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, you all know the principles of ecological theory, right? You guys are also biology. <coughs> you, you work with business, right? If it's social systems or biological systems, we all are familiar with ecological systems perspectives. Okay, so the principles are of this organization, they base it on interdependence, that all systems are interdependent. There's a cycling of resources. In other words, they train people so that they can actually do several different things in this organization. People need to do adaptation to their environment, understand what's going on in their environment, succession. Also, it's not the event center, but it is over a long period of time the change will happen. Um, and the big thing was on prevention, is actually on prevention, making sure that we are not only treating people, that, but that we prevent it from happening in the future. Okay, so here's a little bit some of the programs, I'm not going to go into too much detail. There's training and personal development, counseling programs, play therapy, therapy, transactional analysis, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, all from a systems approach, literacy projects, because if you see that 85% of people have not graduated from high school, and probably much more cannot read or write. Also for of the older population, like I mentioned, people who have not gone back to school in the 70s and 80s. Um, aftercare projects, kids whose parents are working that they need somewhere to stay before parents come home. Uh, teacher wellness projects, because there's so many of the teachers in that community that teach in the schools, they also live in that community. So they are also traumatized. Everybody living in that community, also the people, the staff members of this organization are in the same boat. They don't live somewhere else. Most of them live in that community and are also subjected <coughs> to that kind of violent environment. Uh, mentoring programs, and the target populations are youth, families, men, women, and elderly. And it's done in group context. Um, okay, here's the men's project. Because... Well, Lorraine, can I just ask you a question yes. about the previous slide? Yes. You had the term transactional analysis there. Is that in reference to the uh, transactional analysis that was uh, very popular in the 70s and yeah. 80s, parent, teacher, parent, uh, uh, child, and, and uh, adult. What was, what was the other one? Adult. Adult, yeah, thank you. Parent, child, I adult kind of concept. Yeah. That people will, it's also the whole thing of victimization. Yeah. You know, that, that you can 
interact with people on an adult adult level right. rather parent child because the legacy of apartheid really had this concept of parent child yes. people right. in the black communities were considered to be children sure. you know and the government the white government was the parent yeah, right. we will take care of you according to what we think is good for you that's you know so they are working with these kind of methodologies to help people to come to their own and take responsibility for their own life and environment yes. you know so it, it's a really very powerful i can talk a long long time about all these things but we yeah. don't have that time sure it's actually a fascinating uh, uh kind of approach that they are using to help people to move the men's project is very crucial in this process because the men has been really hurt through uh, apartheid and continuous violence. Uh, just as much as children and women. Uh, but it is often more difficult to get men to participate in these type of projects. Uh, because their attitude is often, no one, no one cares, so why will I? You know, and that results in inhumane, cruel, negative, defiant, and violent behavior. Um, this project mainly focused in on promoting shared responsibility between men and women for upholding sexual rights and decision making over reproduction. I don't know whether you know, but South Africa is one of the countries with the highest HIV AIDS figures. Uh, one in four and one in five people have AIDS or AIDS uh, or HIV positive. That has changed uh, around a little bit, but there are pockets, for example, KwaZulu Natal, which is uh, on the East Coast. That region has probably one in four people, 20 uh, yeah, 25 percent of people. So it's very high. So. It is a very important conversation about reproductive rights and then sexual rights also. Um, youth in ac action, lots of things around youth, uh, what they what are focusing on, uh, skills develop, personal development, capacity building. And here are some of the activities they believe are not only talking, but doing things. You know, so that's why they call it in action. Youth in leadership, youth in sports, youth in training, youth in nature conservation, youth in media. There you go. There's the media piece. And youth in culture. What do they, what do you think MAD stands for? Not what we have here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is that? Music, art, dance, and drumming. Mm -hmm. Well, that is what this group is doing, the cultural yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. yeah. And youth in community is also creating all kinds of recreational activities, healthy cre recreational activities that young people will not start running after the gangs because gangs have become an institution. The street is an institution mm -hmm. there because so many, the people live in the streets because there are not enough uh, healthy recreational uh, facilities actually even available. So, uh, and you, as you all know, peer groups are very important. Doesn't matter where in the world, for young people, peer groups are very important, the influence of that. Okay, so there is indication that this organization is actually making a difference. The incidence of violence in our Nova Park is declining uh, around these three major violent crimes. And I think one of the, even the most important things I would say is that some of the other NGOs are starting to follow this uh, model that they have introduced. That's why I put this picture here. This is, this is Table Mountain. Beautiful country, absolutely beautiful. But so there is hope. There is hope. There is this this 
country is very resilient and as many, maybe you don't know it, but for people who were in the anti-apartheid movement like myself, we thought that South Africa will definitely have a civil war before the changes will happen. And we were, of course, delighted that it didn't happen and that the changes came the way it came. Uh, but it is a very resilient country. I mean, people go down and they stand up and they keep going. And there's a lot of hope because there's a lot of people that are positive about the future. There's a lot of challenges. Uh, Art and I just talked about some of the economic challenges. Um, but people are working hard and they have decided we are here together, we better make it work. So, thank you. So we have 10 minutes for questions. 10 minutes. Good. Okay. Lorraine, are uh, a lot of expat, you know, expats returning to South Africa now? Because I know a lot of people left and thought that there was going to be a civil war and there was no you know, hope other than yeah. the violent solution. And did they see enough hope to go back? And yeah, a lot of that? people have returned, especially in the 90s. Now a lot of people are leaving again also, you know, because the expectation was that that the changes will come much faster. Mm. You know, I think that was unrealistic expectations. These kind of things don't happen overnight because the economy was just in shambles anyway. You know, so many, all the sanctions against South Africa, so many investors have pulled out. Uh, and, and it's now 18 years after apartheid, you know, and yet the country is still struggling because it's a young government. These people were actually activists, terror, so-called terrorists. Now they run the country. They still practice it, how to, to run a country. And there's a lot of mistakes and learning that is happening, you know. So I think in overall that, that they are doing a quite a good job. Jacob Zuma, who is now the president, everybody thought that the country is going to fall apart when he becomes president. And yet it didn't happen quite, quite like that. There's a was there a gap in the professionals too? If you know, if it was in apartheid before education, and then the number of teachers trained and the number of professionals to continue on. Is there an older professional population, white mostly, and then uh, a real gap in Yeah, like I said, the, 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 there's a growing black middle class coming up now, we also not only uh, economically, but also educationally, you know, that uh, we have some really great universities that are training a lot of people, uh, and it is more accessible to black uh, people who actually want to study. So it, it is becoming better. What is happening with the older uh, educated <laughs> group is that by 55, it is expected that you will retire wow. to make space for <laughs> younger people. It's a very interesting phenomenon because the whole society is so young, age in age. Yeah. You know, so uh, that there is such a demand for jobs also that they feel that if you get the right around 55, you need to move out. And can and they do it economically now? Yeah. Well, what, the, what is happening, these people become consultants. The legacy of consultancy in South <laughs> Africa is a lifestyle, and there's money for that also. So they move then into the, the uh, area of consultancy, and they consult them with all these with the younger people sometimes who are not as well trained. So they do a lot of training, workshops, capacity building, that kind of thing. Given the wealth gap that you spoke of, Lorraine, it suggests that a great deal of economic power is concentrated in the hands of a smaller number of people in the country. And my question is, are there uh, experiments going on, are there innovations going on in the ownership structure of of resources and assets in South Africa 
uh, alternative ownership structures other than the sort of classical uh, shareholder or capitalist ownership models? Like co-ops? Co-ops like that? Yeah, there yeah. they are, but they have never really been that, that vibrant. Mm -hmm. And I don't know enough of this sector to really give you a very good yeah. answer with that. Uh, maybe I can just talk a little bit about the land issue because that is still a very contentious issue because mm. during apartheid a lot of the land has been taken away from people kind of similar to here so there is a lot of land disputes mm. still in the courts going on yes. uh, across the country uh, and it is going to go on probably for a very long time because that is also assets that people had before that they don't have anymore. So and that will also change the wealth structure in many ways, you know. So, um, yeah. Well, it, it just as a general principle, uh, one way to sort of get at the question of, of a wealth uh, uh, gap is to uh, design systems, human systems organizations where people own the uh, factors of production, what they're yeah. doing, so yeah. they have a vested interest in it. Yeah. And their labor is not being extracted for the benefit of the owner. Yeah, you know, if you look at the mining system that we have in South Africa, yeah. I just saw this morning on the news, 8,100 mine workers were fired. Yeah. You know, and that is exactly what you're talking, yeah. because the means of production is not in their hands. Right, right. You know, they are employed for very little working in these mines, and the, the conditions uh, in those mines are very uh, deplorable, and uh, violence is a lot happening there. Uh, I come from a project, uh, the community development organization that I work for, we had co-ops. We had the farming co-op, we have a, a woodworking co-op, we have a community health co-ops, we had all kinds of different co-ops. We started with those models, but uh, unfortunately it didn't really take off on a more widespread uh, base, you know, so. Um, Is the government committing resources to some of those things? Because, you know, I think you have you know, a political change in status without a, re you know, any kind of redistribution of resources. Yeah. It, it's almost... You know, that, that is a, it's a very difficult issue, of course, mm -hmm. you know, how do you do the redistribution, redistributive justice pieces, you know, and it is very challenging. Um, yeah, there are resources they have specific social development goals on a government level. But since South Africa is economically very challenged uh, and there's not enough uh, employment opportunities also for people, so the government is strapped also for, for revenue because so few people pay taxes if you really think about it. If 65% of the people are in poverty, who pays the taxes? Yeah. It is that li little group up here that pays the taxes. So you don't really want to tick them off too much that they leave the country because they, their suitcase is probably already packed. You know, so you don't want to, to push too much, although they have a lot of vested interest there. They won't leave that easily. You know, so anyway. Other questions for... Thank you.